I do understand that it's summer and we all have all kinds of things on our plate. Um, so it is nice to come together to talk about school and to think about school um, as we move forward into next year. Um, so I'm going to be talking about inclusive education through a, a multi-tiered system of support or an MTSS, uh, drawing on specific examples from Tri-County. And my name is Kaylin Langell, and I get to do all kinds of different things, which I'm really appreciative of. But I guess officially I'm the Technology Advantage Program or the TAP Project Lead. Um, for Yarmouth High in our region. And I'll talk about that in quite a bit more detail as we go through and draw on some of that uh, for some of the specific experiences that I wanna talk about. Um, I, I know we're a small group this morning and that's okay and hopefully some people join in, but um, I don't need this to be me talking the whole time. If someone wants to chime in, uh, unmute their mic, uh, pop something in the chat, I'm more than happy to, to have a discussion. And of course, Brian and Cindy, that, that goes for, for each of you as well. Um, I'd much rather do that than, than me talking through the whole time without hearing any other voices. And as Brian said, this will be recorded, so hopefully um, other people can benefit from it. Uh, when they have time to watch the recording. Thank you, Brian. Uh, so we'll start off with a land acknowledgement. So we begin by acknowledging that we are in Mi'kmaq, the ancest ancestral, sorry, and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, and this territory is covered by the Treaties of Peace and Friendship, which Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, and the Passamaquoddy peoples first signed with the British Crown in 1726. And we also acknowledge that people of African descent have been in Nova Scotia for over 400 years, and we honor and offer gratitude to those ancestors of African descent who came before us to this land. So my agenda for today, and it's funny, I, I did this slide very last because I feel like I have to go through and organize all my thoughts and then think about, okay, what are we actually doing? Um, so my agenda, and again, if we if we veer off a little bit because we're a small group and we're having a discussion, I'm totally okay with that. Um, but I did wanna share, our, share with you our shared vision uh, within our region. So working collectively to best support the success and well-being of all students uh, through some goal setting uh, to talk about growing our existing structures. So looking at ongoing work within tri County to support student success um, and the implementation of the inclusive education policy through MTS and through examples. And then, of course, looking at these policies put to action with three specific examples from Tri-County. Thank you, Brian. Um, so this, this is a big question, and I've thought about this a lot over at least the last couple of months. And to put some context around this, and, and maybe, Stefan, maybe you were there, I'm not sure, um, but in early May, the, the regions and the CSAP came together in Halifax uh, to, to participate in Time to Thrive. Um, was anyone by chance there other than me on here? Yes, I was there. You were there. Okay, fantastic. So you know what I'm talking about. Um, so it was it was really nice because I think it was the first time since pre-COVID that everyone came together in that way and talked about successes and challenges and moving forward and what does this look like um, and how can we frame this on our students. So like I'm sure you saw with your region, um, we had lots of time going through sessions and, and coming together as a big group, but also spending time with our region to really think about moving forward. And I think our region's big takeaway from that, and everything can almost be tied or framed back to it, was how can we use our collective efficacy to best support the well-being and achievement of all students. Um, and again, that happened in early-ish May, um, our region chose to come together towards the end of May or beginning of June to regroup and to sit down and think about, well, you know, we've had a few weeks, um, we've spent these these two days together, um, what does this look like moving forward? Um, so, so I want to talk a little bit about what that's going to hopefully look like within our region and then share some examples. So Brian, if you could advance that, please, and thank you. So framing all of this or thinking about this through MTSS um, and thinking about growing existing structures into this idea of collective efficacy, um, there are all kinds of examples. And when I sat down to really put this together, um, I had to think about, I, I want to mention everything and mention everyone, of course, but, but what are the big takeaways and, and what can we really speak to um, either things that we do, we're doing a really great job with or things that we've identified as challenges and, and the, the structures and the people in place to, to hopefully grow them in the right direction 
um, thinking about the new year. So when we came together um, with our region towards the end of the month uh, to really regroup and think about this, we thought about our system improvement plan within schools. Um, so largely with a focus on mathematics and literacy and, and climate and well-being. Um, we've talked about and thought a lot about data collection, which I have a bit of a math background, so that's always an exciting one for me and not always exciting for everyone else <laughs> or other people involved, um, but thinking about data in a way that are we collecting it in a way that that's fair and just? And then what are we doing with it? Are we just collecting it for the sake of collecting it? Or are, is there some meaning behind it? And how can we take the meaning behind it to move it forward? Uh, that could be a whole other presentation and discussion, I'm sure. Um, we also talked about looking at um, instructional expectations and best practices, um, what's working right now really well and what's not, and maybe tossing the things that aren't working so well and focusing on the things that are working well, and a bit of a restructuring around collaborative learning time or our CLT groups. Um, so that's something that we're lucky to have in our region um, where we get time, and it's going to change a little bit moving forward in September, um, but within your schools, you have some time once or twice a month, it, it depends. And uh, the students go home early and, and, and we come together as a staff and we, we focus on really the system or the school improvement plan and moving students forward. So thinking about all those big ideas and all those things, um, again, I could come up with all kinds of examples, but in a large way, we do have a number of teams and groups that come together to support. Um, and some of these are regionally based and some of them are school based. So some examples of that would be the regional MTSS networking team. And again, Brian, you can certainly speak to this um, more so than I can, but I think the idea was that Every region was working on this somewhat independently. And then the idea was to come together um, as a province and have representatives from each region to work collectively um, on that, what that means and how to best support schools and students. Um, so I joined that somewhat late in the year, but got to be part of some of the data conversations um, around that group. And, and I hope to be part of that uh, next year in September. Uh, we, of course, have lots of people both in the school and the region working together on the inclusive education policy and what that looks like within our schools. Um, we have teacher support teams within our schools, again, supported by the region. And um, the last example, and I will talk more about this as we go through, is our inquiry-based learning team, um, which is, is largely in place to support the seven and eight renewed curricula and the teachers that are teaching that. Again, that's not, not a, a complete list of everything going on, but so those are some of the big conversations that we had in the region um, and, and some of the ways that we want to sort of, I guess, identify what's working, like I said, for student success and, and what can we change a little bit to make sure that that success continues um, as we move forward. So this, uh, yes, Stefan. Sorry to interrupt there. No, please. Uh, no, you're. Uh, if you go back, Brian, you're like that. That uh, CLT. I heard you maybe say that you uh, dismiss students uh, early and sometimes. Yeah. yeah. So I think. I think so. Tri County has been lucky to have CLTs or collaborative learning time in place for for a number of years. We took a break during COVID when it made most sense to keep students in the classroom as much as we could possibly keep them in the classroom. And I believe it has existed. It may be looked different or be called something slightly different in other regions. Um, but we, I work at the high school, um, at Yarmouth High School. And over the past year, we would dismiss our students. Um, it was at 1.37, so kind of an off time. And we would have the remaining about an hour and a half as a staff to come together in groups and to work towards collective goals. Um, so just to clarify, like, like our CLT is not, we didn't, we, we couldn't afford to implement it at every grade level. Like okay. we are going all the way to, I think, grade six right now. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah. So I think every region has a different. Yeah. Uh, a different structure. Uh, different, yeah, we're different lucky structure. that we have it in, in all of our schools and it's going to look a little bit different during the next school year, but that's the same idea and the same goals um, with student yeah. success in mind. Thanks. Yeah. Great. So, so this is pulled from the MTSS document, and I'm, I'm certainly not going to read through all of those components, although they are all fantastic and wonderful, and I hope that we're doing um, all of those things when we're, we're planning and, and looking at student success. Um, but I did want to focus on three and tie three specific ones to the examples that I'm going to share. Um, so I didn't highlight them, but I'm going to talk about what they are. Um, so it's on the, the second column, and it's the, the second and third one, and then the final one. So I'm going to focus on student-centered professional learning opportunities for staff um, in reference to 
um, our IBL uh, seven and eight renewal support team. Um, I also want to look at structured opportunities for teachers to collaborate, co-plan and co-teach um, through a math 10 example, and then look at community involvement and engagement through the technology advantage program. So these are the three examples that I chose to focus on from our region. Again, there are tons and tons of examples. It was hard to just choose three. Um, there are so many people doing so many great things. Um, I wanted to speak to things that I could speak in detail to and answer questions about if questions came up. But again, this is, this is, this is not a complete list at all. Um, so the first one that I do want to focus on is the Mathematics Technology 10 pilot course. And we'll talk in more detail about that. Um, and linking this to the inclusive education policy um, and thinking about the guiding principles. Of course, it does uh, apply to many of them, but the one that I feel like it really connects with um, is listed there. So 4.8, where all partners are committed and empowered to work collectively to identify and eliminate barriers that interfere with students' well-being and achievement. And looking at that through MTSS, thinking of structured opportunities for teachers to collaborate, co-plan and co-teach. The second example um, that I'm going to focus on, and Brian is going to tell me if I take too long on it, is talking about the Technology Advantage Program, or TAP, um, in reference to Guiding Principle 4.4, looking at inclusive education values uh, that draw upon and include student voices and choices to assist the students in achieving their goals, and looking at that through community involvement and engagement. And then finally, looking at the inquiry-based learning team um, and the professional development that we've been providing and that we're planning to provide for those seven and eight teachers, looking at guiding principle uh, four decimal one, where every student can learn with enough time, practice and equitable and responsive teaching, thinking about or focusing on student centered professional learning opportunities for staff. Um, yes. I'm just going to pop in there really quick there, Kaylin. One of the things that I really like about this, you know, that we have conversations about that kind of um, does come up uh, is that, you know, the examples that you have here are sort of like transcend the individual sort of school or classroom environment. And so it's really nice to see sort of like the big, bigger picture changes that are happening that help to support, you know, folks in the classroom. Um, you know, where, where a lot of great work work is happening, it's nice to see that there are other things that are, are uh, impacted by the inclusive ed policy um, kind of kind of throughout there. You know, our work at the department is really guided by that as well. And, and it's just it's just really nice to see that at various levels, you can see those guiding principles coming through to, to drive practice, which is great. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, thank you. So the first example that I'm going to focus on is the Mathematics Technology 10 pilot and the why behind that. Um, so again, depending on, um, Stefan, what region are you from? I should have introduced myself. I'm, oh, in, CCRC, okay. I'm in CCRC and okay. I'm the coordinator of programs. Here. Okay, fantastic. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I was just curious. So um, I'm wondering about your, your background and how much you maybe know about about the, the pilot proposed um, for, I'm for this. certainly aware of this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's a it's certainly a big conversation. Um, so, so the idea behind this is, I, I guess, early in the year, um, the the regions were invited to submit proposals if they wanted to. So it's just at a pilot stage right now to look at developing regionally. So not on their own, but it could be unique to the region, a pilot course for grade 10 math to at least for the time being replace the essentials pathway and um of course, we, well, I, I, I have taught, I've taught all levels of high school math. I've taught the essentials up to the pre-cal and whatnot. And um, the reasoning behind looking at different avenues and pathways for students, I think is 100% sound. And some of the reasons are off to the side. So I think of all of us would recognize that the essentials pathway does limit post-secondary opportunities for students. Um, from a data perspective, Mi'kmaq and African Nova Scotian students are disproportionately represented in those classes traditionally, and that a pilot course provides an alternative to support students so they can be successful in the Mathematics at Work 10 pathway. So the graphic off to the side is just what I what I see is the most current graphic that shows our pathways for for high school math in our province. And I've got the red oval sort of circled around um, the Math Essentials 10 and the At Work 10. So in our region, 
um, what we've chosen to do is replace the Math Essentials 10 with what we're calling Mathematics Technology 10. The idea is that students will take that course during first semester in September or starting in September, and that will hopefully, or it will, set them up for success to then go into or move into Mathematics at Work 10 during second semester, and then they can hopefully follow that pathway as they go through grade 11 and grade 12. Um, so if you're familiar with um, Mathematics 10, uh, the students do the full year or the 220 hours and get two credits. This will be similar, but it is split into two separate courses. Um, so our students will receive a technology credit for their Mathematics Technology 10 course, and then they'll get their Math 10 credit for, um, for completing uh, the Math at Work 10 successfully. So again, it does... And it's been neat. So as far as I know, there are two other regions piloting this as well. So Annapolis Valley and Halifax. And it's been neat to spend a little bit of time coming together with the people involved there to look at the similarities and differences between um, what we proposed for our regions. So not to go too deep into this, but just a little bit of the background. Um, so we came together to put together our proposal and ours focuses on, as do the others, sort of four main curricula areas or groupings of outcomes. So looking at measurement, geometry, number, and algebra. And of course, these are very foundational in the sense that, you know, you need to have an understanding and, and a bit of a background in these to move up and be successful and certainly to be successful in that at work pathway. Um, of course, though, still sticking to the mathematical processes like you would find in any math course um, that you may be part of or may be teaching. So focusing on communication, connections, problem solving, uh, mental math and estimation, technology, reasoning and visualization. And then, of course, with the, the pedagogy or the ideas and the reasoning behind it, uh, with a large focus on inquiry based learning and experiential learning for those students. Again, big focus on building relationships in a classroom community, uh, a varied assessment. So not just the, the, uh, the, the summative, the test, the quiz at the end of the unit, but varying that assessment the whole way through. Uh, looking at skills-based learning and, and focusing on skills development with the students, uh, bringing in career connections um, and, and showing where this is relevant to what they may be interested in. And of course, integrating technology to support um, an engaging and an inclusive teaching environment. So again, thinking about planning for success for this, um, we, we had a really good team of people come together. And I think that's really important that the people that get to work on these things. Um, it was myself, it was our mathematics consultant, Trudy Camo for our region. It was the math teacher um, that that's gonna be involved in our math interventionalist who's going to co-teach. No problem, Jessica, it's nice to see you. Um, we're, we're an intimate group here, so please join in. Um, raise your hand or, or type things in the chat uh, as we go through, but welcome. So the, the group of the four of us came together early in this semester and, and sat down and thought about what do we need to put in place to start this off successful? So these students um, have the best chance of being successful in that course and then moving them into the at work 10. So when, when the four of us came together and sat down, our big question was, what does equity in, in mathematics or in a math classroom look like? And we kind of landed on these four things. So we thought about sense of community. So creating a sense of belonging to that class, um, building connections. So making this interdisciplinary or cross-curricular and also showing how math can be a part of everyday lives. Uh, looking at voice and choice. So when the students see themselves and their interests reflected in what they're doing, of course, they're much more likely to take an interest in what they're doing. And then the last one's so important, the idea of academic safety. Um, so students are seeing themselves as capable and successful. Um, and we, we know that this, this group of students that's going to come together, they, they likely have not had huge successes with math and their math learning in the past. Um, they might have math anxiety. They might think that they're not good at it. They're not capable. And taking this sort of sense of community and building them up as, as a group that, of course, they're going to struggle and they're going to have challenges, but how can we take those challenges and those struggles and, and sort of build and move beyond them? So to do all these things, establishing a supportive classroom is so important. So again, a lot of talk about the beginning of the year and how those first few weeks and those first few classes need to be about the students and the teachers getting to know one another and, and becoming familiar with, with the mathematics over time. So what does that look like from a student perspective versus a teacher perspective? Um, lots, of, lots of grouping and lots of, of, again, team building together at the beginning and not that we would ever trick students, but 
um, doing some tasks and things at the beginning that of course are have math as a foundation, like problem solving um, and logical reasoning and whatnot, but maybe they're not so overtly math that you know the students shut down initially. So that's pretty important at the beginning, um, allowing them to take risks and to see those successes, um, you know, having an entry point for every student in that class at the beginning um, to build up their confidence, really important. Um, as I already mentioned, building relationships with classmates and teachers, um, that group is together. Um, for the entire year for their math class. So they will move with the same teachers uh, second semester into math at work 10. Um, so looking at what that looks like. Um, and of course, developing skills and competencies to become those confident learners that we hope them to become to be successful through that math pathway. So the second example um, that I wanted to talk through, and again, Brian, woe me back if I talk too much about this one, is the Technology Advantage Program, or what we call TAP, and the why and the reasoning behind that, and then how it does connect to the Inclusive Ed Policy and MTSS. So TAP, if you don't know, it's offered in three high schools in the province. So we have it at Yarmouth High, where I work. Um, it's at Cole Harbor High and at JL Ilsley. And it takes Nova Scotia's education system, and it also takes various technology-focused industries and brings them together to support students in developing skills and competencies. And there's a very strong focus on career exploration and technology integration. And it's very much taught through inquiry-based and experiential learning. And a bit of a context or a bit of a background, um, the students came together from grade eight into grade nine as a cohort. They spent a lot of their time in grade nine and grade 10, again, together as a cohort. Um, they just finished grade 11. They had a little bit more freedom in their courses, but still were together a whole lot. And it will be the same thing in grade 12. Um, they, they, they'll have all of the, uh, yeah, thank you. They'll have all of the, the requirements they need to graduate just as any student would from, from high school in the province with all kinds of extras and, and connections to NSCC, um, which hopefully set them up for a pretty successful future in a technology industry if they choose to go that route. So again, when I when I thought about speaking to TAP and how this connects to me, this and I've been lucky to be involved since the beginning with this group of students. And it's been so neat to see them progress from beginning of grade nine into grade 12 now and to see how they've grown and developed. Um, but when I think back to the beginning, um, when they came into grade nine, uh, I really think of it in reference to tier one supports through MTSS. So. Again, a bit of a background and a context. These students came from the same school. It's Maple Grove. Uh, they were in grade eight together. Um, many of the students um, that ended up making up my class of students in their grade seven and eight year spent a lot of time not in the classroom. So they were, they were pulled out for support for various reasons. Um, when these students began in, in September of 2019, I believe that's when the inclusive ed policy was soft launched as well. So teachers and students were coming to know that um, so maybe we didn't have as much background and understanding as we do right now about it. But the myself and the teacher that I co-taught with that year, um, we decided very early on that to, to make this uh, success and, and to do what we hope to do with it, um, when possible, it made sense to keep the students with us and together with one another in the classroom as much as made sense. Um, and that's what we did. And not to say that we didn't bring in additional supports. Often we had a math interventionist in a lot. She became very close with the class. Um, we had other literacy and resource support in. And if students needed to go for additional support, they could. Um, but very quickly, we, we built a relationship, um, again, amongst ourselves and the students and the students together that they wanted to be there to learn together in the classroom. And when I think about MTSS, again, I think about all of those tier one supports that that made that group successful early on when they came together. So these are the ones that really sort of spoke to us when we started that off. So a culture of high expectations. Uh, my cohort of students that came into the program, they were a cross section. So every possible type of student and learner that you could imagine made up this cohort. Um, but we set a high expectation for all of them. It didn't matter uh, their academic ability or their background. We were setting the bar up here and the students were, were coming to meet that bar. So that was really important. Um, we were making sure that we were inclusive of all students in the common learning environment. I spoke to that already uh, when it made sense and it made sense for them most of the time. We were all together in the same space um, working on, on the common project or whatever it may be that we were working on. Um, this, this led nicely to focusing on student well-being and achievement, um, to, to see those students again where they started off in grade 9, where they are now entering grade 12, there's been a huge um, confidence boost, um, 
a skills boost, a grades boost. It's, it's been really, really nice to see. Um, all that, again, ties into the relational approaches that build and maintain and restore those relationships. I will say that um, this idea is not without challenges. Uh, we spend a lot of time together. And in the grade 10 year, we saw a little bit of what we'd call, I'd say, cohort fatigue where the students are getting sick of one another. Maybe the teachers are getting sick of spending so much time with the students. But again, we, we had those relationships already in place. So we moved beyond those things. Um, and I think we came out a stronger group because of it. And then of course, looking at internal external and external partnerships to support the students and their families and guardians and parents. Um, building very strong relationships with their families very early on uh, helped us to address any issues that come up or have come up um, as we move through the program. So having that positive experience with the parents first off makes it a whole lot easier to deal with maybe some of the not so nice things um, that have come up. Um, but they do understand that everyone wants the best for, for the students and we all have the same common goal. So all of those things very early on, even if we didn't recognize that that's exactly what we were doing, I think they do re relate really, really nicely um, to tier one supports. So what I wanted to focus on with the TAP example, other than talking about its connection to the tier one supports is how important the community involvement and engagement has been with this group of students. And we, we started this at quite a time. Um, of course, we started in, in September, 2019, and then we had COVID hit in March of 2020. And Despite all that, we still maintained a connection to the community and people were flexible and we did what we could to, to keep that relationship and those relationships um, in place. And that's what really took, I guess, student involvement and engagement from like, yes, they're being successful in their work and their outcomes in the classroom. But it was it was coming to life when they connected with the community um, and people outside of the walls of the classroom. So just a couple of quick examples. Um, the picture with all the green shirts is them. This was pre-COVID. Uh, they, they all took a trip to our, our Yarmouth Town Hall and they presented to uh, our town councillors on some ideas around water and sustainability within the area. So that was a highlight for that year for sure. They were all pretty proud of that and we were very proud of them. Um, the other picture is two students who are working on a project with Learning for Sustainable Futures. Uh, they spent a lot of time last year in grade 10 through their science course, um, working on initiatives through that. And they, they were in different groups. They, they had different projects on the go with the end goal of raising money and awareness. And the class consensus was to donate that to communities in bloom. Um, so they're showing off some seedlings there. The next slide represents our two biggest community partners. Um, we have IBM um, on one side and we have a reference to NSCC on the other. Um, so the, the one with them sitting around the table um, on the left was, was pretty special. That was earlier this year. That was the first time we were able to have people physically in our classroom from outside the school system since before COVID hit. Uh, so that's the IBM mentor, or one of the IBM mentors with a group of students um, working through some career and project mentoring. Um, IBM has been a huge, a huge uh, part of, of our program since we began and very much involved with student success and, and moving them forward. Um, the other photo is their instructor from NSCC uh, working on a soldering project with them. So I think they're putting together um, components of, of a satellite that got launched earlier this summer, um, which was pretty cool. So both of those connections have been ongoing since the beginning and they'll be ongoing next year and as those students move um, into post-secondary. And the last example that I'll share from the Technology Advantage program is in reference to their co-op placements. Um, so the students were very excited that they could finally go out on co-op placements uh, during second semester of the year that just finished. And they all had a wonderful time. Um, they were very much engaged with, with what they got to do. Uh, so these are just some examples. So the larger photo on the right is a student who worked at a local print and design shop. And he made, I don't know if you can see, sort of smaller at the bottom in the middle. Um, there are students sporting their tap jacket. So he made those jackets um, for them. So that was a, a really great project that he could complete uh, during his placement and the students all benefited from it. They, they like their swag. Um, the other pictures, so the ones at the top, the smaller ones are a couple of students who got to work on a pretty cool project with the Nova Scotia Fisheries Sector Council. Um, they, 
both of those students have are, are very artistically inclined. They have a lot of ability with design work and, and video and photo and editing. And those two students worked on uh, a project to promote a grant for um, students in, in the industry or working in the fishing industry and helping them to secure some funding for, for their education. Um, the, the picture in the middle or the photo in the middle is one of the graphics that uh, the students prepared. So everyone was really happy with the work that they did and it looked super professional and they had a really cool experience. Stefan. Do you have more than one cohort of kids going through TAP? <laughs> I wish. Um, so it's a, it's a pilot right now. And they, like I said, they came together from their grade eight school. Um, it was an interview process. So similar, if you're familiar with O2, similar to that process for intake, uh, they came together as a cohort. Grade nine is part of our high school in Yarmouth. So they came together in grade nine. And it's just, it's currently, it's just that one cohort. So there would be another cohort going through Coal Harbor. And at JL Ilsley, there are two cohorts. Um, so the hope is that this becomes something more after it moves beyond pilot, but we just have one group right now. Just questioning the um, feasibility, like going moving forward, because we haven't heard of any new cohorts coming out. So I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my, I mean, there, there's been so much not to, not to go off on a tangent too far because I could talk for a very long time about this. But um, we've seen such benefit to student success and well-being um, from from the program uh, that I hope that once these students graduate and are finished next year, when they're done grade twelve and off to NSCC or college or university or or the workforce that. Um, we look at all the ways in which this was really successful and that maybe it looks the same, maybe it looks different, um, but that we can move it forward somehow. Brian. Thanks, Galen. Um, just wondering about this one. Can you, would you be willing to talk a little bit about sort of the response, uh, sort of, I guess, a two-parter of the response from the community? So, um, you know, the uh, going out into co-op or even the uh, the folks that you're having in sort of presenting and working with the students, so what their response has been, um, and also from a teacher perspective, how you're setting the students up for success when they get, get there, because I know, you know, they started in grade nine and that sort of involvement in the community probably looks different than it does now, where there are a few years, a few yeah. years ahead so a little bit about that process if you don't mind yeah sure so um it it again like this was not without tons of challenges and some very very hard work from a very very solid group of people like we've had a ton of support in our school and our region and from the department to make this successful um in grade nine like you can very much think of this as you know the, the principles of ibl and inquiry based learning well at the beginning the teacher is still very much um guiding the students through and and like supporting them and helping them and, and, and leading them along the way. And if I think about where they started in grade nine versus now they're finished grade 11, um, there was a lot of that very structured, strong teacher support early on. So the example of them going to town hall to do their presentation, the presentation was them. They made it and they, they went and they did the, they did the talking to the town counselors. Um, but there was a lot of support from myself and the other teacher who taught, um, taught with me the, that year versus now, if I think about them working on community projects, like for example, the, uh, the Nova Scotia Fisheries Sector Council one on the screen still. Well, my only involvement in that was just the goal between to set up the meetings for the two individuals to come to the school to meet with the students. Like the students now are actively taking on the roles of correspondence back and forth and, and showing their work and gathering feedback and presenting and figuring out what programs and whatnot that they need to use. Um, so we've seen a big sort of release of, of, of responsibility on the students. And that's been so, so nice to see. Um, it's like watching them grow up. <laughs> um, and, and all of that, I, I mean, I attribute to the students, but all of that, um, I think, comes from that very strong foundation at the beginning where we tried to set them up for success with, with a heavy, heavy focus on skill development um, and how they can take a skill. And it doesn't matter what class they're in or what community partner they're engaging with, the, the skills are transferable. So I think that's been huge for us. Um, and I think, Brian, you may have sort of touched on this a little bit, but I think it's also worth noting that uh, we've had a, a, a very tight knit group of, of teachers involved with our program here, and that's been helpful with its success. Um, it's kind of been my whole world for the last three years. Um, teachers that I've worked with who, who teach sort of just other courses, um, it's been nice to see the spillover. So things that we've done in TAP through inquiry um, or through skills development, they're taking in their other courses and they're using them in different ways. So I think that's a nice, um, 
maybe unintended spinoff of the things that we were able to do with those students. Excellent. Thank you. Sure. Well, I guess the last picture there, and then we'll, I'll just talk about that super quickly, Brian. Yeah. So I just think this one's cute. So that's them like working very hard on some thank you gifts for their community host. So again, I didn't have to initiate that. This is end of grade 11. They, you know, took it upon themselves to, well, let's do something to thank the host that we were with for co-op. Whereas in grade nine, maybe at the beginning, it was myself or the other teacher saying, hey, it'd be a good idea to maybe give this person a thank you gift. So again, about that gradual release of responsibility onto the student. So the last example that I'll talk to, and, and those two were very much student oriented, and this one is too, um, but this one is focusing on staff and professional development and looking at inquiry-based learning um, and the team that we have in place to support that, uh, what the team looks like, what we've done and what we're proposing. Um, so the team that we have, I think this is the third year that it's been um, that we've been together and worked together. Um, and it, it's, a, it, it's a combination of regional staff and classroom teachers and the goal is, or the main purpose is, to support the grade seven and eight teachers with the Im implementation, sorry, of the renewed curricula. Um, we focus on professional development and coaching support. Um, that might look like one-on-one -on -one coaching. Um, it may be that we go into a school and we work with a small group of teachers. Um, during COVID, of course, it meant some online sessions. Um, we put together a, a series for our learning management system. Um, so we're lucky in the tri-counties to have that as an online platform and, and modules and courses and whatnot to support professional development. And of course, all of this, because we're focused on the renewed curricula, is focused on skills and competencies. So off to the side there, I know it's tiny to see um, in blue, but there's the, the skills hierarchy um, that would tie to the outcomes and the indicators that we'd be looking at with these teachers in the renewed curricula. So our big fun idea, and I, I think it's I, I think it's going to be successful. I would certainly want to do this for PD if it was an option for me, is that we're putting together what we're calling an IBL retreat at Camp Birchdale. Um, or Birchdale Camp. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, that's about an hour inland from Yarmouth. It, uh, it has no internet access. It's a, a beautiful setting. It's very much um, connected to nature and appreciating nature. Um, it used to be called Novanata. If people are more familiar with that, it would have been in the news uh, a number of times throughout the last few years um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, but our idea is to lead the grade seven and eight teachers who decide they want to participate in this through an inquiry. So as if they're the students and we're the teachers uh, facilitating this um, during the two days that they spend there. So one of the goals being a very high value on collaboration, of course, focusing again, again on the skills and the competencies, uh, making cross-curricular connections uh, where it makes sense, and hopefully leaving with ideas to use with their students in their classroom um, and understanding that this is our specific example that we're doing together at Birchdale, um, but what from this is transferable to your classes and your courses. So like I said, this is two days, so they'll, they'll be sleeping in, um, sleeping in cottages or cabins and uh, kind of like camping, but I think it sounds like lots of fun. So on day one, when they arrive, um, again, we're thinking of them as being the students and leading them through this in an authentic way. Uh, they'll be greeted with a, a wonder table. So that will have all kinds of artifacts on it and maps and articles. And that will hopefully help us introduce our inquiry question and hopefully have them generate questions and, and start a discussion about this, again, without too much of us poking and pushing. Um, again, this is meant to be on them to come together and discuss. So the big inquiry question that we hope to introduce from this would be, how can we manage our Acadian forest to benefit all species? So the setting of Camp Birchdale is, is in the middle of the Acadian forest, and we'll be very much connecting to that as we work through um, different activities with these teachers. So once they come together to do that, and we, we have a discussion about our inquiry question, um, they'll be broken up into teams or into groups, and then they'll be rotating through stations or mini lessons. And we had a lot of discussion about it, but instead of focusing each of those um, stations or mini lessons on a particular outcome or course, we instead chose to focus it on a skill um, to drive home the fact that the skills are transferable. And, you know, you could take a project or an inquiry and you can focus on the questioning skill um, and that might come up in your English class but also your science class and maybe your healthy living class um, and so on. So the four stations and the four skills that we identified were one is going to be question so uh, the person putting this together is making connections to the history of the area 
Um, we're going to look at the apply skill, um, which will focus on land use and sustainability of the area um, with a connection to Hurricane Dorian, which did some damage certainly to that area and, and many areas in the province. Uh, I think that was back when we started TAP in September 2019. Um, and, and how they sort of dealt with that um, at Camp Birchdale. Um, Analyze is going to be me. Uh, that's going to have a bit of a bio spin. So looking at quadrant species sampling um, using a quadrant and, and some data collection and some questioning around that. Um, and looking at evaluate, um, focusing on the conflicts of land use. So again, not to spend too much time, but if you're not familiar with the area, um, it was the home of an order of silent monks for Quite a long period of time and they they existed there sort of in peace in that beautiful setting in nature um, until Irving came along and the work that Irving was doing was was noisy and conflicted with sort of their their views and what their intentions were um, and looking at that conflict and how that got resolved and what came of that. So once they spend time doing that, um, the, the sort of coming together at the end of the day around the campfire, which will be quite nice, is, is debriefing this in a very sort of informal and, and casual way, but also focusing on skills. So looking at creating and reflecting or create and reflect. Um, so they do have one of the cabins at Birchdale is sort of set up. Of course, it's, it's geared maybe towards children, but it will apply here. Um, set up with art supplies. So a place for you to go and, and really express what you're feeling or thinking creatively. So we're going to have the teachers sort of go to that space and create something personal based on the experiences that they had. And then of course, working through reflect. So again, more about the experience that they have, and then how can we move this forward into practice in their classroom? And then on day two, um, we're going to kind of solidify it or, or bring this all together and tie this back to best practices and what this looks like in practice in our classrooms. Um, so super important, but sometimes I think we forget is focusing on asking good questions. Like inquiry is all about asking questions. Um, students don't necessarily know how to ask great questions. Adults don't necessarily know how to ask great questions all the time. Um, so some strategies and tips around building um, good questioning skills with your students. Um, we're gonna focus on assessment of IBL, which is always quite a hot topic. Um, so looking at formative assessment and assessing skills and how we assess skills within those outcomes. Um, talking about co-creating rubrics with students so that they're part of that process um, and understanding the achievement levels when we do the assessment of those students. And then of course, um, really important uh, would be collaboration. So it's been a long time since you know, we, we've come together in person to do PD and, and to work with people from maybe other schools. So time for them to work together, to look at the renewed curriculum documents, to think about the courses that they teach, um, to make connections and to plan for student success. Um, so that's happening sep in September and we're pretty excited about it. And we hope that it's successful and we hope that the, uh, the teachers take a lot back to their classrooms from that. So, so Brian had uh, breakout groups prepared for us, but um, I don't know that we need to do that based on the number of participants, uh, but I've done an awful lot of talking and uh, thinking through those examples, again, specific to our region, but really, I hope transferable anywhere. So two sort of big points that I would like myself and I guess everyone on here to think about would be, what do you think the impact has been or will be from these examples? And also, what can you take from these examples to use in your school or your region to support student success? And we can certainly just have a conversation about that. Or I'd love ideas too. Well, one of the things that comes uh, comes up from the last um, uh, the last section there about the, the two days for professional learning, like mm -hmm. on that day two, you were talking about that idea of you know students being engaged in in questions and so that their interests and their voice is really part of um, like the education experience for them in the classroom uh, and how that is sort of like start at the beginning with engage, like get, generating your inquiry questions or or thinking about how those questions can scaffold your learning experiences over time and then also that co-construction of the rubrics as well. So it's like your active partners with your students in the classroom that that piece really does come through quite nicely in those in those scenarios and so you know in relation to your question there about the impact it feels like that idea of motivation and students feel safe and and uh, comfortable in the classroom like that stuff really comes through by having that embedded in in your methodology and knowing that your teachers are going to be working together and kind of having that shared experience and developing their shared understanding you've got that sort of like amplified not just in one classroom but in many classrooms in a school or you know in an entire sort of like junior high itself or 
or what have you there. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. It seems like that that will have a very positive impact in terms of the the motivation and the the success that the students will have because they're engaging in the renewed curriculum there. Yeah, and, and that's the hope too, right? It's it's funny to prepare PD or professional learning for teachers specifically around inquiry based learning. It it's so easy to just like I did for this, prepare a you know a Google Slides presentation or a PowerPoint presentation and go through all of these best practices and ideas of how to make it work with your student. Um, but then we've kind of just done the opposite of what we're proposing is successful for students. So the idea at Birchdale is really to, you know, we're not going to have computers, we're not going to have laptops, we're not going to have internet. Um, so forget the like sit and get idea, but let's take these through as if they were students going through a learning experience. And what does that actually look like? And again, not without challenges, it can be kind of scary. As teachers, we like to plan things a lot. Um, and with inquiry based learning, there's still tons of planning, but with that aspect of, of release to the students and, and, and voice and choice and direction of student interest, you have to let some of that go. And I hope that that's one of the points that comes through with the teachers that get to be part of that. 